Hello, I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Jason Saul. I'm editor of the Harvard Journal of World Affairs, Harvard's first journal of international policy. The journal is pleased to sponsor this, the first in our distinguished speaker series. The next lecture will be given by Madeleine Albright, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations at the Harvard Club of New York City in June. On behalf of the journal, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Robert Gates, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency and distinguished member of the journal's advisory board. He joins such other international figures on the advisory board as Brian Mulroney of Canada, Valerie Giscard d'Estaing of France, Yasuhiro Nakasone of Japan, Graham Allison, and Shirley Williams. For those of you interested in finding out more about the Journal of World Affairs, please inquire at the table near the main entrance of the room. I would also like to thank Katrina McDonald, Dusty Fogo, Norman Boschman, Walid Shimon, and Patricia Langen for all the help they put into making this event possible. And now I'm pleased to present our beloved Dean, Al Carnesale. I've been called a lot of things. Beloved, that may be the first. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jason. Um, I'm Albert Carnesale, Dean at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. I'd like to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of the Harvard Journal of World Affairs and the Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics for this delightful evening. Uh, the journal is uh, a rather unusual journal. It is managed by students and uh, written in part by students, but primarily by policymakers, scholars, uh, experts, uh, and public managers from around the world. The, the focus is on policy, on ways in which international affairs really affect national policy-making agendas. And uh, tonight's event is sponsored by both of those groups, and we're delighted that our speaker could be with us. Let me say a few words uh, about Robert Gates, who's devoted a career to public service and to the security of the United States. Uh, presiding over the Central Intelligence Agency over the past year and a half required a steady hand, an ability to appreciate, to frame, and to meet the challenges of the new world order, or perhaps we should call it the new world disorder, whichever it may be. In November of 1991, at the age of 48, Bob Gates became the youngest person ever to assume the position of Director of Central Intelligence, the so-called DCI, for those of you into acronymphomania. He was also the first CIA director to have risen through the agency's analytical branch. Now, the analytical branch is where raw intelligence is organized and analyzed and assessed, as opposed to the operations branch, which is primarily in the business of collecting intelligence. Uh, like many successful careers, this one depended upon an element of chance. Uh, while studying for a master's degree at Indiana University, uh, Bob Gates accepted an invitation from a CIA recruiter to come to Washington for an interview. He later admitted that he accepted the invitation only as a way to get a free trip to Washington. But he accepted still more, namely the CIA's job offer. He arrived in Washington, as he said a couple of years ago, and I quote, with everything I owned in the back of a 1965 Mustang and no money. The Mustang is long gone sold before it became a collector's item, and I still have no money, close quote. Uh, Bob Gates' career has involved much moving back and forth between the CIA and the White House. He served on the National Security Council under Presidents Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Bush, rising to the rank of Deputy Director of the NSC. In a similar manner, he climbed the ladder at the CIA and wound up standing at the top that is, as the Director of Central Intelligence from November 1991 through January 1993. As DCI, he reconfigured the nation's intelligence community to reflect the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire. He was the first CIA director to visit Moscow to discuss cooperative measures to counter the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and the first to fight organized crime, drug smuggling, and terrorism. He promoted a new level of openness at the agency, 
in its relations with Congress, in its declassification of documents, and in its relationships with universities, including this one. Uh, just to digress for a moment on a personal note, it was a number of years ago when he was the deputy director at the CIA that we engaged in discussions within the Kennedy School and the Central Intelligence Agency about conducting executive programs and research programs involving analysts primarily from the agency and scholars here. And the problem was that CIA in the past had not had unclassified contracts where everybody knew exactly what the study was about and what the program was. And we said, but we can't do a classified contract. And Bob Gates said, and you shouldn't have to do a classified contract. And that's when this program started. To show you how good our judgment was, I was uh, reminding him earlier, I can remember Graham Allison, former dean of the school, Ernest May, Professor Ernest May, who was the chair of this program, and I, sitting in Graham's office trying to figure out when should we release the press release that was going to announce this, because we believed we would catch hell. Getting in bed with CIA is what we saw, uh, and we believed it was the right thing to do, and we were prepared to do it. So we issued the press release late on a Friday, being advised that nobody reads the Saturday papers. <laughs> Turned out they were largely right. Where we were wrong, however, is in those places where it was picked up, the headline was, Harvard Open CIA. <laughs> it was entirely positive. Bob Gates has a doctorate degree in Russian and Soviet history from Georgetown University, and his involvement in policy analysis at the highest levels makes him one of the most sought after voices these days on the former Soviet Union and on the rapidly changing landscape of international affairs. He's received the National Security Medal, the Presidential Citizens Medal, and is a three-time winner of the CIA's highest award, the Distinguished Intelligence Medal. Please join me in welcoming the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, Dr. Robert Cage. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. And thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Al. As I say, it's a pleasure to be with you. I have to admit, though, after 27 years, it's a pleasure to be anywhere but Washington. <laughs> you know, a place where so many people are lost in thought because it's such unfamiliar territory. <laughs> where uh, one of the few places in the world where you can see a prominent person walking down Lover's Lane holding his own hand. Whereas uh, Senator Al Simpson said, those who travel the high road of humility encounter little heavy traffic. <laughs> it is, of course, a city of monuments. Uh, most of the things that I've seen are monumental, that are monumental, uh, however, are the egos, Washington. First president that I worked for was President Johnson. President Johnson once had Chancellor Earhart of Germany down at the LBJ ranch, and Earhart at one point said, Mr. President, I suppose you were born in a log cabin, and Johnson said, well, I know, Mr. Chancellor, I was born in a manger. <laughs> <laughs> or the time that uh, Johnson had a stag dinner, and he asked Bill Moyers to ask the blessing, and Moyers seated well beyond the salt as an appropriate White House aide, started to pray, and about 30 seconds into the prayer, Johnson said, Bill, speak up, I can't hear you. <laughs> and Moyer said, Mr. President, that's because I'm not speaking to you. <laughs> uh, or the place where uh, Richard Nixon once meeting with Golda Meir, gushed to her right after he'd appointed Kissinger Secretary of State, gushed to Golda Meir, just think, Madam Prime Minister, we both now have Jewish foreign ministers. And Golda Meir said, yes, but mine speaks English. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I've seen some monumental screw-ups in 27 years. The first state dinner I attended, under an administration not to be named yet, was for the president of Italy, and the White House was decorated with hundreds of yellow chrysanthemums, the Italian flower of death. <laughs> the second state dinner was for the chancellor of Germany, of the Federal Republic of Germany, and the after-dinner entertainment was Joel Gray singing highlights from Cabaret. <laughs> but I think the best of them all was when President Nixon took a trip to Italy and decided to visit the Pope. And Kissinger decided that Secretary of Defense Mel Laird, who was on the trip, should not be invited to attend. His Secretary of War and the Pope and so on just didn't seem right to him. So he didn't tell Laird about the time and place of the meeting. So Nixon is in having his private audience with uh, the Holy Father and the rest of the Americans, including Kissinger, waiting outside for uh, this to end and for the general audience and Laird comes striding down the hall having found out I suppose through good military intelligence uh, the time and place of the meeting. He was smoking an enormous cigar. Kissinger was extremely put out to see that Laird had made it and said Valmel at least extinguished the cigar and Laird stubbed it out and put it in his pocket. And the Americans all went in in a few minutes and the Pope was seated at a little table, and there were two rows of high back chairs facing him for the Americans. And Laird sat on the end, on the back row, and Kissinger sat next to him. And about 30 seconds into the Pope's remark, Kissinger heard a little slapping noise, and he looked over, <laughs> and there was a little wisp of smoke coming up out of Laird's pocket. The situation seemed under control, so he looked back at the Pope, about another minute passed, and he heard this frantic slapping. <laughs> and he looked over, and smoke was billowing out of Laird's pocket. The Secretary of Defense clearly was on fire. <laughs> now, the rest of the Americans present heard this slapping going on and thought they were being cued to applaud. <laughs> and so they did. <laughs> and as Kissinger put it, God alone knows. But the Pope thought, and then he saw the American Secretary of Defense immolating himself <laughs> and the entire American party applauding the fact. <laughs> well, enough of the joys of public service. <laughs> Barely 20 months ago in Moscow, a new era began in world history. We already see a world transformed, a world in which the forces set loose are magnified by the collapse of communism, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and the end of the Cold War will command our attention for the rest of all of our lives. In this world teeming with revolutionary change, only one thing is certain, and that is that the new world order will be neither peaceful nor orderly. The words of historian Peter Green sadly are still all too true when he wrote, the grim events of the past 60 years have taught us that man's life, alas, remains much the same that Thucydides or Thomas Hobbes saw it, nasty, brutish, and short. And this is all too true tonight in Bosnia, India, Somalia, Russia, and numerous other places. Too many nations and factions and groups have concluded, as that great philosopher Johnny Carson once put it, that you can get more with a kind word and a gun than you can with a kind word alone. With the breakdown of communism, age-old ethnic, religious, political, and regional conflicts have reemerged with a vengeance and now threaten to ignite the Balkans and Central Asia. And they undermine the stability of numerous states from Africa to Europe to the Middle East to South Asia. Violent disputes that we hoped had ended linger still in Afghanistan, Cambodia, and Angola. At the same time, famine in East, Af East and Sub-Saharan Africa threaten millions with death 
through starvation and disease. Elsewhere, we see threats to the stability of nations and regions around the globe because of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and a growing trade in illegal drugs and connections between international drug and crime cartels. These are just a few of the issues that, despite a desire to focus primarily on domestic affairs, inevitably capture the attention of our government because they have a very real impact on global security, on the security of our friends and allies, on our economy, on our consciences, and most importantly, on the future of our country. These and other issues I want to discuss tonight demand the continuing attention of our government. So too do they require that universities and think tanks and private advocacy groups do their part to educate the public to the reality of permanent global engagement, to educate bright young people to understand and interact with the rest of the world, whether they're in the private or the public sector, and to help government understand the ways in which international affairs will continue to affect our national policymaking agenda. I believe that Harvard, the Kennedy School, the Journal of World Affairs each make an important contribution uh, in these areas. With the end of the Cold War and the collapse of Soviet communism, we live in a far less dangerous world in the sense that the danger of a major war in Europe or a global thermonuclear war has diminished almost to the vanishing point. Yet the events of the last two years have led to a far more unstable, turbulent, and unpredictable world. Our hopes for a new world order have given way to the reality of an enduring new world disorder a disorder rooted in very fundamental phenomena. The first of these phenomena is the collapse of a totalitarian imperial system covering more than a sixth of the world's landmass. From Berlin eastward nearly to Alaska, from the Arctic Circle to South Asia and the Black Sea. There is no precedent in history for an empire so vast and so old imploding so suddenly. The demise of far smaller, far younger empires in the past has shattered the peace, disturbed the social order, and rearranged the international landscape so fundamentally as to be grasped usually only by historians at decades removed. An aggressive totalitarian state possessing 30,000 nuclear warheads has disappeared, giving way to 15 states facing multiple internal crises economic disaster, instability, and vicious ethnic warfare, and still possessing 30,000 nuclear warheads. The political crisis now playing out in Russia is not just a conflict between old hardliners and new reformers, but also between different versions of the future among the reformers themselves. Above all, many in Russia question the pace and scope of economic reform and the accompanying level of social distress. Overlaid on this are growing nationalism and anti-Western feelings, deep cynicism toward politicians and their disputes, and powerful centrifugal forces that are increasing the political, economic, and cultural distance between Moscow and the rest of the country. And however positive and encouraging the apparent results of yesterday's referendum. These cross currents and conflicts and deep rooted problems will remain and many will intensify. In some, a fragile new democratic government simultaneously is facing three intertwined crises, political, economic, and ethnic. Any of the three of these crises would shake a deeply rooted democracy. Yet a newborn Russian government faces all three simultaneously and must try to survive in a country that has known no economic initiative for a thousand years but that from the state. For a thousand years has known no political history but despotism and for centuries has known nothing but imperial centralism. There is only one forecast about Russia today that can be made confidently. And that is that this process of political and economic reform, if it works at all, will take decades and we'll see repeated detours, blind alleys, 
mistakes, confrontations, disorders, strong-arm tactics, and even bloodshed. And we, in turn, must keep our perspective and not be driven from euphoria to depression to fear, depending on the latest ticker from the wire services out of Moscow. We must prepare for the long haul, be steady, help where we can and where help can be useful, but always bearing in mind that the outcome of events in Russia will be determined in Russia and not in America. Make no mistake, realism about our limited influence does not mean we lack appreciation of the stakes involved. Should a nationalist, more anti-Western, less reform-oriented government come to power in Russia, not only would economic reform slow dramatically, but pending arms control treaties such as START likely would not be ratified. The dismantling of nuclear weapons would slow. Tensions between Russia and the other republics, especially Ukraine, would mount dangerously. And the cooperative Russian approach in addressing international problems that we have become accustomed to could become a fond memory. And that's the best case. A political earthquake of nearly incalculable dimensions has taken place in Eurasia. And we will feel and deal with the aftershocks for many, many years. A second cause of the new world disorder is the emergence or resurfacing of ancient conflicts suppressed for decades by the global superpower confrontation. Contrary to recent notions, history is not over. In many places, it simply has been frozen and now is reemerging with a virulence that we Americans ignore at our peril. Nationalist and ethnic conflicts of a long ago world have survived the ravages of 80 years of war and revolution to confront us again. The bitterness and horror of such conflicts are most evident in the daily television pictures from the former Yugoslavia, especially Bosnia. Tens of thousands killed in combat, more than 100,000 indirectly killed in conflict, millions of homeless, the savagery of ethnic cleansing. This is not the face of Europe we expected to see after the death of communism. But it is a face of enduring human hatred with which I regret to say we will remain all too familiar. These passions are driving policies elsewhere in Eastern Europe, though not yet so violently, as well as throughout Central Asia, South Asia, Africa, and elsewhere. Additionally, tribal and clan conflicts have emerged in third world countries to destabilize governments, threaten post-colonial national unity, and bring enormous hardship in Sudan. Ethiopia, Liberia, Eth uh, Somalia, and others. For other countries such as Zaire and Kenya and Afghanistan, tribal conflict is now or will threaten to tear them apart. In other cases, conflicts often seen as wholly political or ideological in the West are also tribally based. Conflicts such as between the Angolan government and Jonas Savimbi's UNITA, and the Hosa-dominated African National Congress and the Zulu-based Nkata movement in South Africa. What all these conflicts have in common is that they are singularly resistant to diplomatic solution or compromise. They have far more in common with Northern Ireland and with Kashmir than they do with the standoffs and crises of the Cold War. A third source of the new world disorder is the accelerating spread of weapons of mass destruction and the sale of conventional or super conventional weapons to third world countries. The countries of greatest concern because of their policies and behavior are North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. North Korea has a nuclear weapons program and they may have a weapon. The country has just dropped out of the nuclear nonproliferation treaty. It has a million-man army, two-thirds of which is stationed within 60 miles of the demilitarized zone. It is producing and selling ballistic missiles to a number of countries, including Iran. And it is in the middle of a succession. 
Iran is pursuing weapons of mass destruction in every category. It has a major chemical weapons program, including a stockpile of up to 2,000 tons of blister, blood, and choking agents. It has a biological weapons program. It is seeking to build a nuclear weapon, and its search for reactors to buy has focused on those optimized for the production of plutonium, not electric power. And it has now bought a reactor from China. And it is buying ballistic missiles from North Korea. Iran is also engaged in a major conventional forces buildup, including three diesel submarines, one of which is already in the Persian Gulf, MiG-29 fighters, Su-24 fighter bombers, tanks, cruise missiles, and more. Iraq's programs for weapons of mass destruction were severely damaged in the Gulf War and have been further set back by the UN inspections. Even so, it retains some 7,000 scientists technicians and engineers in its nuclear program, large chemical weapons stocks, and a firm determination to resume these and its biological weapons program just as soon as UN sanctions are lifted. South Africa, a few weeks ago, confirmed that it had built nuclear weapons, but claims to have destroyed them. India, Pakistan, and Israel are all assumed to have nuclear weapons. Up to two dozen countries have chemical weapons programs, and at last count, 14 already were in possession of ballistic missiles. Beyond the weapons of mass destruction, we must worry also about the potential sale of what I call super conventional weapons, primarily by Russia, to some of these aggressor or terrorist sponsoring states. Weapons such as precision guided munitions, cruise missiles, fuel air explosives, Technologies such as lasers and low observables or stealth. In short, American and other troops carrying out peacekeeping, peacemaking, or humanitarian missions in the third world in just a few years could encounter weapons and technologies that they expected to find only in a conflict with the Warsaw Pact. The fourth cause of the new world disorder is the bankruptcy of statist ideologies and economics and the aging of long-lasting personal despotisms that pursued such policies. In China, North Korea, Zaire, India, and more, the failure of socialism, statism, and or the abuses of personal despotisms are setting the stage for radical change in the future. At best, it will be turbulent. At worst, it will be very violent and destabilizing. Fifth, Natural disasters from drought and the resulting famine in East and Sub-Saharan Africa, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, and even the AIDS pandemic in Africa have placed burdens on a number of governments that they simply are incapable of bearing. Sixth and finally, the new world disorder derives from religious fundamentalism that threatens to destabilize a number of secular governments. This is true of several in the Islamic world, including Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt. At the same time, the government of India is beset by the clash of Hindu fundamentalism and Islamic fundamentalism. This fundamentalist phenomenon, grounded in economic hardship and alienation from modern cultural trends, especially as those trends challenge or undermine traditional values, is a development of grave concern. I believe that as both ethnic and nationalist conflicts worsen and as religious fundamentalism grows, there will be a steady increase in the resort to terrorism. As elements of each seek to draw attention to their cause or seek revenge for real or perceived defeats, ethnic and religious hatred recognizes no international boundaries. This is a bleak picture I present proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, ethnic and religious conflict, regional disputes that threaten to involve us, savage civil wars that require intervention to save Americans or provide humanitarian assistance, an unstable Russia with 30,000 nuclear weapons assailed by economic, political, and ethnic crises and more. Some say that we should avert our gaze 
from all of these problems and look to our domestic concerns. That the blood shed by Americans in two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, and the Cold War, the more than two trillion American dollars spent in defeating communism is enough. One can sympathize with the sentiment, but we must remember that repeatedly in this century, Americans averted their eyes in the belief that events in remote places need not engage this country. How could the assassination of some Habsburg Archduke in unknown Bosnia-Herzegovina bother us? Or the occupation of a little patch of ground called Sudetenland? Or a French defeat in a remote place called Dien Bien Phu? Or the return of an unknown cleric to Tehran? Even if we could ignore such political realities, we cannot in 1993 ignore the economic realities. And those realities mean that turning inward is simply not an option for the United States. The reality is compelling. Foreign trade is critical to our domestic economic health. 70% of our economic growth in the last five years has come through foreign trade. All the states, all 50 of them, have seen a growth in exports in the last five years. Indeed, in 1991, the United States recaptured first place as the leading exporting nation in the world, about $600 billion worth. 72 million Americans now work in export-related jobs, an increase of 44% in the last five years, 42%. As these numbers show, our national economic well-being is inextricably linked to the world around us. Attitudes toward and perceptions of American leadership and its role as a force for democracy and international stability by people and governments around the world affect not just our political influence, but also our economic relationships and markets. A final point about the economic implications of American leadership in the world. Much of mankind today is emerging from the political and economic wasteland of communism, authoritarianism, and the catastrophic legacy of statist economics. These revolutionary changes lie behind much of the turbulence and violence and instability that we see. But from the ruins of these systems, and the ashes of these conflicts inevitably will arise new societies and the need to rebuild shattered economies. With vision and boldness and leadership, the United States can not only play a major role in helping build democratic institutions in these countries, but also in rebuilding these devastated economies creating new infrastructures in telecommunications, transportation, energy, and others, creating new industries, modernizing old ones, partnering to meet new needs. It has been a steadfast conviction of Americans after each great conflict in this century that with the war over, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War now, we could finally get back to normal times. Could at last, like Cincinnati, return to wholly domestic pursuits? Americans have always considered war and conflict as temporary aberrations from normalcy. And so four times in this century, 1918, 1945, 1975, 1953, we have precipitously disarmed ourselves, declared a peace dividend, and tried to turn inward. But each time, our hopes have been dashed against the rocks of reality. And that harsh reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that as long as the human race is around, there will be no peace, no international tranquility. Ambrose Bierce once defined peace as a period of cheating between two periods of fighting. 
The historian Will Durant once calculated that in the last 3,500 years of human history, only 300 have known no war. Obviously, the level of danger to we as Americans will vary. And the threat to our homeland today from deliberate military attack is almost infinitesimally a small. But like it or not, our political and economic interests are global. And just as the advent of intercontinental ballistic missiles in the 1960s made us physically vulnerable, so today our dependence on foreign energy, on foreign trade, our integration with world financial markets and other economic realities make our economic well-being and our very daily lives exceptionally vulnerable to events abroad. Further, we as a people have always supported efforts around the world to build democracy or protect human rights or cope with various natural disasters and humanitarian problems. Americans must at long last put aside and abandon the dream of putting down the burdens and responsibilities and costs of global leadership. We cannot pretend to ourselves for, a fifth, ourselves for a fifth time in this century that there is such a thing as normalcy or international tranquility or that American leadership can be bought on the cheap or that somehow we can ignore the problems of the rest of the world and remain untouched by them as we tend our home fires. The real world is a messy tangle of risks and opportunities, of Russian crisis, of Chinese and Iranian rearmament, of North Korean nuclear ambitions, of evil leaders like Saddam and Milosevic, of weapons proliferation, of international alliances of drug and crime cartels. But it is also a world in which today we see an unprecedented spread of democracy, of international economic partnership and investment, of expanding global trade and shared prosperity, and limitless opportunities to invest in building a better tomorrow in dozens of countries. The polls say that Americans are hostile to foreign assistance, including the no newborn democracy of Russia. There are many who say that with the menace of communism gone, we should drastically reduce expenditures on defense, diplomacy, foreign assistance, and intelligence. In short, the instruments of our national, international leadership. Well, we are reducing expenditures in these areas, in some cases dramatically. But we must not cut so quickly or so deeply that the inevitable rebuilding is, as so often before, tragically costly both in lives and treasure. We must act wisely and cautiously. The new world disorder, for the fundamental reasons I have described, stretches indefinitely before us. It is the human condition. The world continues to need American leadership. Most nations seek it. Our own political, economic, and security interests demand it. And sustaining our leadership and encouraging the continuing march of political and economic freedom means sustaining the substantial investment and commitment to defense, diplomacy, foreign assistance, and intelligence. After the Treaty of Amiens in 1802, Napoleon wrote, what a beautiful fix we are in now. Peace has been declared. Contrary to what you might think, the leaders of our national security institutions, both past and present, do not feel that way. They too recognize that these institutions must change to cope effectively in a dramatically changed world a world in which the security danger from Russia is not aggressive intent, but deep internal crisis and instability, a world in which there are many trouble spots demanding attention simultaneously. Our national security institutions must reorient their focus, adapt their capabilities to this new world. But in a world caught up in revolutionary change, where instability, turbulence, and violence are widespread and where no one can predict the shape of events to come. We must not weaken our ability to lead and to act. We must not create a doubts abroad 
of our ability and our will to sustain our strength. Throughout this century, when America has been strong and engaged, international stability, democracy, and international cooperation have been strengthened. When we have weakened and turned inward, difficulty and even disaster has followed. We must not repeat for a fifth time in this century the strategic error of short-sightedly and willfully weakening ourselves, staking our and everyone's future on our hopes rather than on global reality. As our national security institutions change, they must do so in ways consistent with the world we see, not the world of our dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gates is, has some time to take some questions. We have two microphones, one here and one here. We'd appreciate if uh, people would line up by the microphones, and when I call on you, if you would uh, identify yourself and uh, have the imagination somehow to frame it as a question would be, uh, would be helpful. So. I think this is a question. I'm Holly Kaufman. I'm a student here and a writer with the journal. And if you could, um, a question. Could you please tell me um, what you think the future is for U.S.-Cuba relations, and if you think there has been or will be any shift in U.S.-Cuban policy? I think that Castro was in serious difficulty last fall. He was isolated. He had virtually no allies. The Russians had essentially cut him adrift. He was in serious trouble at home. Their economy in Cuba was in desperate uh, condition. And then the United States passed a law that extended extraterritoriality to the embargo and frankly went so far beyond what was necessary that it served the in opposite of the intended purpose and I think created sympathy for Castro and a willingness on the part of some other countries at least to extend uh, a modest hand to him. I don't, I haven't heard the Clinton administration speak to the question of Cuba, but I think that it is still important to keep Cuba isolated because I think that the measures that were being taken create the circumstances that once Castro departs the scene, uh, that there will be a, a change of system, not just a change of leadership in that country. I think there are very few countries, perhaps none other than East Germany, the former East Germany, that have the potential for making the transition to a better life faster than Cuba, uh, given the number of Americans who are will, going to be willing to invest there uh, once a change takes place. But I think an, an absent a, a dropping of the embargo by the United States, uh, I think that the relationship will continue to be a very strained one. And, and I think that's probably the way it ought to be until Castro uh, uh, gives way to a more democratic system. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Otter. I'm an MPP1. Um, as your uh, frightening and somewhat fear-mongering survey of world disorder seems to indicate uh, you're searching for a role for your former $30 billion agency, uh, which is now adrift. Um, my question is this. In crisis after crisis, the CIA has bungled, uh, has predicted that Hussein would not invade, that the Soviet Union would stand indefinitely, that the Shah would stand, etc. cetera. Um, even if we accept your vision of the world disorder, is there any reason to believe that the CIA, as an intelligence agency, has a constructive role to play in it? Um, and why should we place, place our trust and our money 
in this agency, which has made so many gross mistakes, and uh, it's classified, does not qualify as an answer. <laughs> Thank you. I wouldn't dream of taking that dodge. <laughs> First of all, the, the budget figures that are bandied about cover all of the agencies of the American intelligence community, the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, um, now it can be said the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, and, and others. CIA is a relatively small fraction of that. But the essence of your question I think the answer to the essence of your question is I would, I would pose it in two, in two ways. First, there is a great deal of attention that is focused on what I would call these great thumb-sucking estimates that get done over the years in which we seek to divine the mysteries of the future in which, where we have no evidence and where we try and make some forecast. And we have made some errors. I would say that we have had some extraordinary successes. We called what happened in Yugoslavia absolutely dead on the mark. We began calling attention to the crisis in Russia in the Soviet Union, both economic and social, in the late 1970s. And I invite anyone who wishes to do the research to go read the Joint Economic Committee reports of the Congress beginning in that year. No question about it, the statistical analysis of the Soviet economy was off the mark. We lost sight of the fact that it was a notional analytical construct and had no real reality to it. But I think that the agency did a good job of documenting the uh, crisis in the Soviet Union. In fact, it was so good that when I was at the White House in the fall of 1989, I assembled under the auspices of one of your present faculty members, Bob Blackwell, a very secret group to begin doing contingency planning for the collapse of the Soviet Union, better than two years before it happened. Now, let me say what the second part of the, my answer to you is the following. The Congress, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, and presidents of both political parties do not, are not willing to pay the price for U.S. intelligence to get these estimates. What pays the freight for U.S. intelligence and the reason why year in and year out, Republican and Democrat, our political officials are willing to pay the price is because of what I call the river of information that flows to U.S. policymakers every day. How long are the runways in Somalia? Where are the death camps in Bosnia? Who's in charge? Who's dying? Who's in charge in Bosnia? Tell me about the North Korean nuclear program. Tell me about the Iranian rearmament. Tell me about diesel class submarines in the Gulf. Tell me about the leadership in Iran. Tell me where the 30,000 nuclear warheads are in Russia. Tell me you can monitor arms control agreements so that the Congress will ratify them. It is that body of data that flows out of human and technical sources year in and year out that pays the rent for U.S. intelligence. It informs the U.S. policy process, and now it is informing the international process. It is U.S. intelligence through the State Department that informs the U.N. inspections in Iraq that helps determine where the humanitarian assistance is needed most, that helps in these international peacekeeping arrangements. That's what pays the price. And that, I think, is what warrants the use of taxpayer dollars. Um, my name is Wally Chamoun. I'm a research associate at the Kennedy School and a member of the journal staff. Um, as a Lebanese citizen, I'm quite concerned with the Islamic extremism 
and not be fundamentalists that are known you know, in the American media. Um, my question is the following. Uh, in a recent, actually, in a recent uh, exclusive interview with General Michel Aoun of Lebanon, he predicted that the Islamic fundamentalists or extremists will topple all the moderate secular regimes in the Middle East, and i.e. Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Kuwait. Uh, do you think that this will happen? What's your observation on it? And what do you think the Israeli reaction will be? The problem of Islamic fundamentalism, I think, is one of the most complicated that faces American policymakers. Instinctively, I believe that it is a bad idea for the United States to f put itself in the position of being hostile to a religious belief, and especially one that is observed by as many people in the world as is Islam. I believe that to a considerable degree and this is as much a hope as it is an analysis, that Islamic fundamentalism is a distortion of Islam by political groups and by governments for their own secular ends. And it is that that we need to be concerned about. And it is that that we need to work with other governments to try and cope with. But I think we make a serious mistake if we speak too generally or we speak too cavalierly in a way that allows people to believe that the United States is setting its face against Islam. So I think we need to do more work, both intelligence and the policy community, in terms of the way in which these groups, factions, governments, and others are using uh, Islamic fundamentalism, if you will, as a front for other purposes, and then try and deal with the problem in that manner. And I think in that way, if we do that, then we will have strong friends and allies in the region, and we will not find ourselves uh, with a much broader cultural and political gap uh, with the Middle East. Um, I also happen to think that that's a sensible strategy from the standpoint of the government of Israel. Uh, my name is Greg Corbett. I'm an undergraduate student here. Um, you said earlier that, uh, that the United States should not turn inward and should not be weak. Um, what I was wondering is, do you mean that the United States should turn outward and assume the role of the, the world policeman and try to put a stop to the new world disorder? And um, do you think it's possible that if we turn outward and take on this new role that the, uh, that the new administration would support this? <clears throat> I think we have to try and draw a distinction between what I would call vigorous international leadership and becoming a world policeman. Because I don't think that the American people, much less the administration, would support the role of world policemen. We acted in Iraq and we acted in Somalia because we were the only ones that could act. In the case of Iraq, because of the size of the problem. In the case of Somalia, because of the need to act quickly to get food to people. But then as quickly as possible, making the transition to other international forces as soon as they could arrive and pick up the responsibility. It seems to me that the first way that we should look at a, at a problem is whether others have the capability to respond as well. And if they do, then I think our leadership role makes it incumbent upon us to try and organize that or get them to organize it in a way that they can deal with the problem. 
And I think a number of the problems that we're looking at around the world fall into that category. And that's what I would call leadership. I think it is a mistake for us to jump in immediately on every problem that we see and assume that we are the only ones that can act and then try and take responsibility for acting. I don't think we can do that. I don't think it's bureaucratically feasible in Washington and I don't think it would have political support on the Hill or in the country. I think it's going to end up having to be a case-by-case -case decision on the part of, of any administration, including the present one. But I think that has to be the criteria. Can others act? We, we can't be the only ones to deal with these problems. Can others act? Where can we help them act? Can we foster their cooperation to try and assume responsibility in some of these areas? And I think that's the distinction that we have to try and maintain as we go along and, and deal with these various problems uh, as they come up. Well, uh, I, I guess, I, like, as I see it, it to me anyways, um, the U.S. Is, is the only power now that, that can assume that role. Do you see that this is going to change, that you said we should take it case by case and see if there's going to be someone else out there that can assume that role? Do you think that's going to happen? Right now, I, I see the U.S. as the only power that can assume this position. Well, let me, let me give you... Um a couple of specific examples. I think the handoff to others in Somalia is exactly the way that it should have been done, and that's taking place. So we're not stuck there with a large force for an indefinite period of time. But let's take the case that's on the front pages every day today, and that's Bosnia. I do not believe that the United States is the only country that can act in Bosnia. Bosnia is in the Europeans' backyard. Their interests are more effect directly affected than ours. They clearly have the military, economic, and the military and economic wherewithal to take action. What they seem to lack is the political will to do so. But does that mean that the United States then should jump in and seize the leadership and take the action itself? I don't think so. Because I think that then does put us in the category of world policemen. When there are others who can take the action, who, uh, others who have the capability, others who are closer, and others who have the resources. Now, the sad fact is, the tragic fact is, people are dying while they figure out whether they can get the political will together. But that's true in a lot of situations around the world that don't get as much attention and aren't on the front pages of the newspapers. And I just, I think that the cautious approach that both the Bush administration and now the Clinton administration have taken with this problem is warranted. Because I think it's one of those areas where you are on the balance beam between leadership, which is helping them act, and I certainly think that uh, supplying them with intelligence and logistics and whatever other support would be in order. But having them take the lead as opposed to the United States, in my personal opinion, is the right way to go. I think it also helps the administration make the case to the American people that we're not going to jump in every time there's a problem around the world that has to be solved with our own soldiers and our own, uh, on our own resources, particularly when others can act. Thank you. I, I was just wondering, uh, what's the niftiest espionage, ga espionage gadget you can describe to us without compromising national security? I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> this pen. <laughs> Well, I can't, I can't, I, 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 I didn't duck by saying the answer to his question was classified, but I will to yours. But I will say this, and I say it partly in fun, but totally in truth. We've got stuff. <laughs> that would stagger even Tom Clancy's imagination. <laughs> Thank you.
Good evening. I'm Lee Hochstetter. I'm a reporter for the Washington Post. I'm being posted to Moscow next summer, and I'm here at Harvard trying to learn Russian. Um, I would uh, appreciate your snap analysis, if I could uh, prevail upon you for it, of the referendum in Russia yesterday. And uh, on top of that, if, if you could make a few specific remarks on some of the players and your personal experiences with them, your personal evaluations of them in Russia. I'm thinking in particular of uh, uh, the head of the Supreme Court, Mr. Zorkin, um, Mr. Kaspulatov, the um, Speaker of the Parliament, um, and Mr. Volsky of the Civic Union. What was that again? <laughs> Well, first of all, I premise my answer on the referendum by, by saying that I'm going on the basis of the news accounts as of when I left Washington, which showed that there were substantial majorities for um, approval of the way Yeltsin was doing his job, a strong majority for the um, sort of how do you like reform so far question. A strong majority opposed to early presidential elections and a strong majority favoring early parliamentary elections. My personal opinion is that that's about the best outcome we could have hoped for. Um, I think it gives, I don't think it's going to solve the problem. For one thing, the parliament it, it, I think, is very much up in the air, the degree to which the parliament will accept the results of the referendum. But there is absolutely no getting around the reality of the referendum as an expression of support for Yeltsin and for the, for the process of reform uh, and an expression of uh, unhappiness with the parliament. And so I think it will give Yeltsin a badly needed boost uh, given the erosion of his power that's taken place since December. I think this struggle, though, will probably continue, in part because of divisions among the reformers themselves about what Russia should look like. I, I know that, uh, that my remarks about Russia uh, were, um, I didn't intend them to be downbeat, simply realistic that this is going to be a very long process in Russia of reform. That said, I think it is damn near a miracle that we are where we are today compared to two years ago. I think the Russians have taken to democracy, uh, to political reform, with a, a skill and a fervor and a commitment that is astonishing and nearly miraculous in a country that has so little experience with it over its thousand year history. And I think that should give heart to everybody. Uh, and I think the way I would characterize myself is a sort of a short term pessimist and a long term optimist. I think that this thing is going to work out, uh, but it's going to take a long time. And, and they're going to go through some very difficult times. But I think this referendum is a very important uh, step in what is going to be a, a very long passage. In terms of the players, I really have, other than uh, uh, President Yeltsin and a few others, I have very little personal experience with, uh, with most of these players, Kozbalatov and Volsky and so on. But I think it is important that we not put ourselves in the position of characterizing everybody but Yeltsin as anti-reform. Some of these people are for reform in some areas, but not in others. They are foregoing perhaps a certain distance, but not all the way in certain categories. They favor a different pace less social distress. Um, they may favor a more nationalist approach, but not necessarily an extremist one. There are plenty of those around. All I'm trying to say is that I think that we ought to be cautious about 
using our Western standards of typecasting these players in a way that narrows the field in which we can interact with them. We need to bring, in my opinion, all of these guys over here and talk to them and see what they believe, see where there are differences between them and Yeltsin. To what degree are the differences in, among some of these people uh, couched simply in terms of political ambition or power relationships as opposed to their real views on reform and what should happen to Russia and what their dream is about Russia, where they think Russia ought to be. And I just don't think we know enough about that. And, and I think this business, you know, I got asked this question on television a lot. Do you think the administration has stuck with Yeltsin too long? That's the wrong question. Yeltsin's the president of the country, and to a very considerable extent has been the engine of reform. You have to deal with Yeltsin, but that doesn't mean you can't deal with anybody else. And so I can't address specifically the views that you've asked on Hasbulatov and Volsky and Zorkin and so on, but I think that that in itself suggests the value of getting some of those people over here and of our journalists spending more time with them and perhaps asking fewer questions about what they think about Yeltsin and more questions about what they think about reform and where they ought to go with respect to reform. If I could follow up. With all respect, there has been an absolute mountain of uh, information about those people in particular. And I'm surprised, given your own area of personal expertise, um, that you couldn't speak a little bit about those three. But let me try you on one other. Um, the man most frequently mentioned as uh, a potential successor to uh, president Yeltsin is, of course, his vice president, Mr. Rutz, Mr. Rutskoy. Could you evaluate him for us, since he, by all accounts, seems to very, be very likely and possibly uh, uh, soon we'll see him in uh, Mr. Yeltsin's office? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll respond to that, but I'll also respond to the others. Yeah, I can talk to you about what I think Hasbulatov's and Volsky's views are, and there is a mountain of information about him but most of it is written in the context of the political struggle with Yeltsin. And, and that's the point I was trying to make. I have a, uh, I have a not very positive, having just said all that, I have a fairly, I have a relatively uh, um, I'm not very much of a, of a Rutskoy enthusiast. Um, but again, I think that he is a hard man to typecast. Rutskoy has favored certain of the reforms that Yeltsin has also favored. And at various points over the last year, he's been an important ally for Yeltsin. That said, I don't care very much for some of Mr. Rutskoy's friends and supporters. They tend too often, in my view, to tend, o uh, uh, tend over toward the uh, more nationalist view. I think that if Mr. Rutskoy were to come to power, I would worry that relations with the non-Russian republics uh, would worsen because of his views on uh, the protection of Russians and the other um, um, republics. But again, I, I'm more worried about Rutskoy's view toward the West and on the nationalities question. I think he's a more complicated figure when it comes to some of the reform questions inside Russia. Okay, well, if I can try and take these three uh, questions, if we can make them brief ones, then mm -hmm. there, then there. Mm -hmm. Dr. Frank, if you answer. Uh, my name is Steve Rogers. I have a follow-up question on Bosnia. If the, if the agency uh, had it called exactly as it was going to occur prior to its occurrence, and um, was there any point at which the government, our government, could have intervened in terms of leadership or in terms of military action, say when Dubrovnik was being bombed, um, to um, stop what we're facing now? And is there any point in military in intervention at this point? Is there any advantage to it? 
I think it was because, first of all, the agency began writing about the potential problems in Yugoslavia about 1985, mm -hmm. and then began being more and more specific uh, as, as time went along. I think it was in part due to intelligence that the administration, the Bush administration, was convinced that the Serbs were going to pursue their territorial ambitions outside of Serbia. It was out of the hope that some sort of a mechanism could be found to deal with that peacefully that the Bush administration opposed granting early recognition to the independence of Croatia, Slovenia, and the other states. Because once you start with the inevitability that there will be an aggression, before recognition, you have an internal problem. After recognition, you have, for the first time since World War II, or just after World War II, open aggression in Europe. And what's worse, you have an open aggression about which nobody's doing anything militarily to stop it. Because there was an understanding that no one was prepared to act militarily to stop it. And so there was the hope that you could perhaps buy a little time to try and deal with the problem. And I think that was in part based on the intelligence about what was certainly going to happen. But the Europeans wanted to rush ahead and wanted to recognize Croatia and so on. The problem that I have is separating sort of historical reality with the humanitarian tragedy that's going on. There were a million Yugoslavs killed in World War II. The Germans killed 200,000 of them. Of the remaining 800,000, 700,000 were Serbs who were killed primarily by Croatians. For the Serbs, this is payback time. And my belief is, as you read the newspapers and you see the reactions of the people who are the victims of this conflict, you recognize that if you send a military force into Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, in order to maintain peace, they will have to stay there forever. Mm. Now, we've had a peacekeeping force in the Sinai for 20 years. 25, almost, yeah, you know, 20 years. But it seems to me that's something the international community ought to deal with, not one country by itself. And I think it's that reality about military intervention on the ground that people have to take into account. Now, I think there are some other options in terms of both sanctions and, and perhaps other measures against Serbia that might cause them to, to perhaps change their policy, although I wouldn't bet on it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Gates. My name is Mark Goffman. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. You spoke of American security in a global economy where resources are flowing uh, among nations freely. I wonder how the CIA has adapted to these changes as opposed to their traditional role in monitoring troops and uh, things behind the, the Iron Gate. If, if if you could comment on that, and um, also your role as, as a director um, coming from an analyst background as opposed to operations. Well, first of all, clearly the agency has something to learn about international banking. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are going into areas that are <clears throat> new for us, but I think that's true of of most of the national security organizations. Um, I think it's true as true of the FBI as it is as it is of us, and we just have to learn as we go along. <clears throat> and sometimes those lessons are fairly painful um, as you try and figure out how to do things better. Um, I think that the 
the salient experience for me in becoming director was the opportunity to combine experience in policy making agencies and particularly at the White House with knowledge about how the intelligence community and how intelligence works. You almost always have one or the other but not both. And, and I saw too many times when intelligence was too late or too ambiguous or too definitive uh, to be useful. And, I, and just in terms of too definitive, what do you mean? How can intelligence be too definitive? It is when intelligence says Saddam is not going to invade his neighbors for the next two or three years. He's going to lick his wounds and rebuild. We ought to know better than that, and the policymakers ought to know better than to take us at our word because nobody can predict the future. And where you can help the policymaker, and what I learned from the policy experience was the best way to help a policymaker on a, an unknown like that is to help him think through the problem, help him or her think through the problem. What are the alternatives? And how do you prepare for any one of those? It is that combination of the policy and intelligence experience <clears throat> that I think had the biggest influence on me as director. Hello, Dr. Gates. My name is Doug Nagley, and I'm a Harvard Extension School undergraduate. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about China. Uh, given China's awful record of human rights violations and at least the past administration's unwillingness to tie um, most favored nation status to China's human rights status, um, what other means do you see the United States and the world community in focusing China to adhere to even the most basic human rights um, policies? There is an extraordinary revolution going on in China now, and it is an economic revolution. China's economy is growing now at about 13 percent a year. It's projected to grow at 9 or 10 percent, or perhaps better for the rest of the decade. They've enjoyed a 30 percent growth in uh, trade surplus with the United States every year since 1985. The greatest advocates of reform in China are those who are behind the economic reform process. And it seems to me that measures which have no impact on the political leadership in Beijing, but potentially have a significant negative impact on precisely the forces of reform that we're trying to encourage is not the direction we want to head. My hope, and I can say this now that I'm not in official position, my hope is that as this economic change in China spreads from the southeastern provinces and becomes more and more of a force in the country, that in essence, those who govern in Beijing will become increasingly irrelevant to what's really happening in that country. And that with any luck, there will be a quiet transition that happens over a period of time and kind of day by day. And without another Tiananmen or without another coup attempt, a la Moscow, but in essence just sees a shifting of the power to the new forces of China, or the forces of a new China. And I think we ought not keep still about our concerns about human rights in China. We ought to make clear where we stand. I think there are measures that we can take to make that felt. But I think imposing economic restrictions um, is a ready fire aim approach. If I could follow up, if, if you don't advocate the economic sanctions, what, what other things can either the United States or our other governments can do? Um, if it's not most favored nation status, what, what is it? Well, I think that there are um, perhaps some political measures that might be taken in terms of, you know, I don't know, I really haven't given it a lot of thought in terms of um, 
of where you go with that. Um, I think, for example, the one area, and now I'm kind of going back to the first part of your question, I think one area we have to watch and be very concerned about is China as a proliferator. And, <clears throat> and there you may get involved in some kind of uh, measures that do involve um, economic kinds of things, but perhaps they focus on certain kinds of technologies rather than broader trade questions. Let me uh, just say a, a final word of, of thanks to the journal who uh, arranged to have Bob Gates here, to the Student Advisory Committee of the Institute who co-sponsored the event, and to you for your terrific questions, and finally to our guest, Bob Gates. There's a reception or something.
We have